Well, I've got a quick quiz by way of introduction for you this morning. Okay, you have to identify the mission statement. Okay, number one, to be our customer's favorite place and way to eat and drink. Any ideas? McDonald's. McDonald's. Here's another one. To inspire and nurture the human spirit. One person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. Starbucks. A wee bit mystical, isn't it? Out there. What about this one? Uh, to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Yes, Facebook, Facebook. What about this one? To create value for customers to earn their lifetime loyalty. Tesco, Tesco, they're out for you, oh yes. What about this one? To give everyone a voice and show them the world. YouTube, YouTube. You get the point, you get the point. Uh, the mission statement, uh, you know, sums up just why these companies exist. Now, we could get cynical and say that they exist so they can get all our money out of us, uh, but that's not really going to sell coffee or burgers. That's the way it is. But these mission statements, they're, they're useful for keeping focus within the said company. Uh, we could even say that our Bible comes with its own mission statement. 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that why God has given us the Bible? To lead us to Jesus that we may be saved. Or take John's gospel for another example. And it comes with its own mission statement. John 20 verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Well, what is our mission statement then as the children of God? Let me take you to 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why has God chosen you, believer? Why has he saved you? So that you may proclaim his praises, so that you may be a witness bearing testimony to your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus starts now in Luke 8 here, um, the second circuit of preaching throughout Galilee, we're reminded of his own mission, Luke 8 verse 1. He went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Now as he started on his first circuit of preaching in Galilee, back in Luke chapter 4 verse 43, Jesus said, I must Preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. That's his mission. Uh, and this really is what I want us to see this morning. The mission of the gospel itself. And to get to the very heart of it, I want us to start with Christ himself. And from these three short verses at the beginning of Luke chapter 8, I want us to see then the heart of the Savior, the heart of his servants, and the heart of our service. Number one then, the heart of the Savior. Verse one, now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. Now remember what Jesus said back in Luke 6, 45. He said... Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's coming out of the mouth of Jesus? The kingdom of God. His heart is filled with the kingdom of God. Indeed, he has come.
come to inaugurate that kingdom. He is the king. He had not come to restore national Israel and deliver them from the Romans. He's a different kind of king entirely. He is God's servant king. Come to save his people from their sins. And for sinners to be saved, they need to be released from the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of light, freed from the kingdom of Satan, translated into the kingdom of God. And it is none less than God's own king, Jesus, who does the rescuing. He has come to seek and to save those who are lost. He has come to do battle for sinners who are enslaved, who are held captive in sins. And the battle you know, has begun in earnest since Christ was born. And it will rage hotter as Christ in his life approaches the cross. And as Jesus lays down his life for sinners on the cross of Calvary, he will cry, it is finished. And the battle will be over. And the salvation of all God's people will be secured. Finished. But as we listen to Jesus preach, even before that day, we hear the victory cry already. Because he proclaims the glad tidings of the kingdom of God now. Already our saviour knows what is before him and knows the end result. He knows the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. See, the good news, it is already a certainty. Already in the heart of Christ is a joy that is set before him. What's the joy? His people will be saved. And so Christ has come and he will endure the cross. And then he will sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, his heart, it is filled with divine love for his people. They will be saved through faith in him. And faith cometh by hearing. And so he preaches the good news preaches. He brings the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. He heralds, he announces the gospel itself. The kingdom of God has come because the king has come. And he announces salvation for all who will believe. And he loves it. He loves it. He he loves to preach the good news. His heart is for lost sinners held captive by sin. Again, from that heart filled with love and filled with you know, the gospel, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Have you heard him? Have you heard the voice of Jesus? In the times that you've heard this same gospel preached. Have you responded to him in repentance and faith? That's why we sang the words. Have you heard the saviour calling? All to leave and follow him. Have you felt his person drawing with compulsion lives to win? Hearken to his invitation. To the music of God's grace. Let the peace of God's salvation fill your soul and love embrace. Oh, hear him. Hear Jesus. Hear his voice. Because this message of the gospel, it is for you. It's for you and me. You know, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angels announced glad tidings.
tidings to the shepherds. Uh, Luke 2, 2 verses 10 and 11. They said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The gospel is for all people. And so we have Jesus here preaching the gospel in every city and village. It's for everybody. There's a wonderful inclusivity about the gospel. It's for everybody. We used to sing red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. It's for everybody. It's for the atheist and for the religious. It's for the despicable and it's for the respectable. It's for the Catholic. It's for the Protestant. It's for Muslims. It's for communists. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All need to be rescued. All need to be saved. And Jesus is the only saviour. Follow the example then of your saviour this morning. Preach unto all. May our hearts beat in time with his divine heart. Filled with the mission of the gospel. And Luke then gives us a little snapshot of this large group of women whose hearts indeed are taken up with Christ. And all they desire to do is serve him. But before we look at their service, we want to consider what makes them tick. Why do these women serve Jesus so willingly and at their own expense? Our second point, the heart of his servants, verses 2 and 3. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others, servants. Now each of these women, they've been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Okay, each of them have have had their lives transformed. Each of them have been delivered from something that they could not deliver themselves from. And in every case, it's Jesus. Jesus has been the one who has set them free. Jesus has been their deliverer, their savior. They have all had this personal encounter with Jesus. And it's not just the three mentioned by name. There's many Many in verse 3. And they've all seen Jesus for who he really is. They all have a story to tell. They each have a testimony as to how Jesus changed their lives forever. And that personal story that they all have, you know, kind of cuts right to the heart of each one of them. It wasn't just, you know, that their body was healed. It wasn't just that they've been delivered from spiritual forces that were warring against them. Their encounter with Jesus has changed them. Changed their heart forever. They love Jesus. Their deliverance has resulted in hearts being filled with thankful love and devotion. And Luke has already given us a very graphic picture of that same love and devotion to Christ at the end of chapter 7, which we saw last time. There we met a woman whose love for Jesus was undeniable. She washed his feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. She anointed his feet with this expensive fragrant oil. Remember what Jesus said about her? Chapter 7, verse 47. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And and we were careful to understand Jesus' words the right way round. She loves much because she was forgiven much. Jesus 
likened her to a great debtor who owed more than she could ever repay. But the debt was cancelled by the creditor. Her debts were written off. And because of that love so freely given to her, she loves in return. She really loves Jesus. And now Luke reveals to us that, well, she's not the only one to have encountered this wonderful forgiving and healing and saving love of Jesus. There are many more. But he singles out three. First is Mary Magdalene. Delivered from seven demons. Hard for us, I think, you know, to comprehend or to understand the enormity of her deliverance. We just don't know what such a demon possession would have been like for her. Suffice to say, perhaps, that it must have been awful, a terrible ordeal. How these malevolent evil spirits tormented her. We'll probably never know just what that was like. How they affected her actions and her words. And perhaps even her affections. We don't know. We do know from other scriptures that demons often caused self-harm. Those who were possessed were a great danger to themselves and to their loved ones round about them. And what we do know of this Mary is that her heart, her body, her soul is now free. Set free by Jesus and she loves him. She is totally devoted to him. She'll be there at the cross. When many others desert Jesus, she'll be there. She will sit by the tomb when Christ is buried. She will be there first on Easter Sunday morning at the empty tomb. She will see angels on that morning. And when they ask her, why are you weeping? She will reply, because they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. And then she'll hear Jesus say her name. Mary. And she will exclaim with holy joy, Rabboni, my master. She loves Jesus. He's her saviour. He's her Lord. He's her master. Then we have Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. We're not told specifically just how she was delivered by Jesus. She's included in the certain women who'd been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. But we are told that she was the wife of Herod's steward. And so it is. The gospel, as preached by Jesus, has reached the house, uh, the royal house. Uh, Chusa there, he was a household manager. It was a position of considerable authority. And we might sort of think that's an unlikely place to find a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And indeed, we're not told that Chusa himself was a disciple. If he was, then his love for Jesus has put him in a very dangerous place. This is the same Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. Looking forward, Herod in Luke 23, verse 11 He'll try to cross-examine Jesus. He wants to see some great wonder done by Jesus. But Jesus will say nothing and give him nothing. And then Herod will treat him with contempt and mock him in Luke 23, 11. So if Chusa and his wife, if they are both disciples, then they are both in great danger. And if Chusa himself is not a believer then the situation is all the more fraught for his wife, Joanna. But either way, Joanna, she's the focus here. It's her love and her devotion for Jesus that we see. She's willing to serve. Even if that live, means you know, living under threat, living in danger, oh, he's worth it. And so she serves him. She serves him. She loves Jesus. Her heart's transformed. And then Susanna... And this is all we get. 
This is the only reference to her in the scriptures. It's all we know. She's saved by Jesus. She serves him wholeheartedly. It's a really short testimony, isn't it? But isn't it a brilliant testimony? Saved and serving. Loved and loving. Is that your testimony? Is that your testimony right now this morning? I love Jesus because he first loved me. I serve Jesus because he saved me. An excellent testimony. Three women noted for their love and devotion to Christ. Three women who are willing to express that love practically in days when following Jesus is a dangerous thing to do. And yes, I'm sure they suffered for their devotion to Christ. Maybe their own children thought them silly. Maybe their husbands thought them weird for following this man, Jesus. Maybe their friends thought it was a waste of time and money and effort providing for this itinerant preacher. But out of hearts delivered and renewed, they serve their master with costly love and devotion. And it did cost. It did cost. Number three, the heart of their service. Uh, Luke records in verse three that these women provided for him from their substance. No two things about the heart then of their service. Number one, it was for him. Now some translations read for them and they include the 12 disciples. But either way, this provision is for Jesus and his mission. They see a need, a need to provide for their Lord and his friends, and they want to see to that need. They recognize it, and they want to fulfill that need. It's all for Jesus. And their provision really explains how Jesus managed uh, to go through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. I mean, how did he eat? And the disciples. How did they afford lodgings as they travelled about? How did they finance the mission? We don't really think about that very much, do we? We just kind of think, well, it just happened. Christ never used miracles to provide for his own uh, immediate needs. He never did that. He depended on others round about him. Sometimes, you know, we, we lose sight of the practical details even in these things. And these women are a great example to us. Because they saw the need. And then they met the need. On Friday and Saturday past, um, junior camp had two brilliant days up at Crumlin. Boys and girls had great fun. They bounced their legs off in the bouncy castles and a big inflatable assault course. It was just brilliant. We went to the beach on the Saturday. We ran up and down the dune uh, on White Rocks Beach played games and tug of war and lots of other things played games just round about the church we did crafts we had brilliant meetings and the gospel was heard and we sang camp songs praise to the lord the boys and girls were challenged and encouraged to follow christ and to keep on following him that was brilliant but there was a lot of practical planning behind it all Buses had to be organized and drivers for the buses. Leaders had to be pocket checked and so on. The bouncy castles had to be booked and rebooked. Talks had to be prepared. Memory verses had to be written out on big large canvases. Crafts and games had to be thought about, planned beforehand. That's for all the meals that the children ate together. All of that had to be brought in. Prizes, tuck shop, bookstore. And a million other little things come together to make camp. But you get the picture? For the gospel to go forth, there was a whole lot of practical things needed to be sorted out. It's not easy work. It's time consuming. Stressful. Often laced with various disappointments along the way. And the gospel work.
work is like that. But it's necessary. And it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Because it's for him. It's all for Jesus. Work done for Jesus. Even the most mundane work of, you know, cleaning the church or painting the church or servicing the brakes on the minibus, when it's done for him, it is worth doing. And yes, there's always lots of other things we could be spending our time and our money on. But the fact remains, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus will last. And that extends into every avenue of our day-to-day lives. Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Yes, there's a cost to living our lives for Jesus. These women, they provided for him from their substance. Their substance being their own money, their own time, their own energy spent for him. But they gave. They gave of their own substance willingly and freely because he had first changed their lives and transformed their hearts. Do you understand that? Do you recognize that? Has your heart been transformed by the Lord Jesus. Because it shows. Are you giving of your substance freely and generously and willingly? Willing to prepare that talk for Sunday school or YPA? Willing to take someone out and buy them a cup of coffee and set them down and tell them about Jesus? Willing to give financially to the church at home and abroad? Is Jesus your Rabboni, my master, my savior? If he is your master, then your service will match your heart and you'll do it gladly for him. You'll give up your substance for him. Before we leave this, picture of these many women helping the Lord. I want us to see one more thing about the heart of their service. You could almost miss it. They did it with him. Verses 1 and 2. And the twelve were with him and certain women who had been healed. They were with Jesus. They served with him. They were part and parcel of that great gospel mission. They're with Jesus. And being with Jesus means that they got to see other lives transformed by his grace. They they got to hear Jesus as he preached the gospel. They saw Jesus as he lived. They saw Jesus as he died. They saw him risen from the dead. These women, they heard his parting words, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Believer, as you serve your Lord and Master, he is with you. You never serve him alone. At times you may feel alone, but if you're serving your Saviour, He's with you. When you serve him through praying for the lost, he's with you. When you serve him through giving, he is with you. When you serve him by getting the courage together and being that faithful witness, telling a friend about the Savior, he is with you. When you serve him in godly womanhood, When you serve him in godly manhood, he is with you. When you serve him at school, 
or at work or in the football club he's with you when you serve him in the practicalities of kingdom life he's always with us and that's the very heart of all our service of the master it's for him and it's with him so don't hold back he has saved you he has brought you into his kingdom he has delivered you from the penalty of sin. He has delivered you from the power of sin. One day he will deliver you from the presence of sin entirely. His heart is for you. Or may our hearts be for him. May our service be for him. And may we know his presence and his joy as we serve with him. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Amen. Now let's pray, please. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are humbled by our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for his heart filled with the gospel, filled with love for sinners filled with love for us who are so unworthy and we feel it. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went from village to village and town to town preaching the good news. Lord, we pray that you would help us to do likewise. But as we see your heart, Lord Jesus, we pray that our hearts would beat in tune with yours. And we thank you, Lord, for the way you have indeed transformed our hearts. Because, Lord, you have saved us. You've set us free. You've paid the debt. Lord, will you help us now, please, to be busy for Jesus, busy with Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, please, when we serve ourselves. Give us, Lord, a heart to serve your people and to serve, Lord, a needy world that needs the gospel brought to them. Lord, that we would see that great gospel need. That sinners are dying in their sins and going to hell and they need to hear of Jesus. May we serve for you, Lord Jesus, and may it be our joy to serve with you. We thank you, you are bringing them in. Lord, hear our prayers. Transform us, change us, bring us on further with yourself.